Um, I have chosen, after a short um, survey in the audience, to um, give my speech in English rather than in German. Because um, I think if we do have guests who travelled a long way to come here to Bremen to help us set up a, a fab lab in Bremen, um, it's only polite to um, address them in a language they might understand more easily than German. Ich könnte es auch auf Deutsch machen, aber ich mache es nicht. Um, brief overview uh, of what I'm going to talk about. Well, the title, maybe. Um, Fab Labs is a place for interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary exchange and learning in higher education. Um, translates into the overview. A first... Um, will address the topic of fab labs and learning and what is happening uh, in, in learning uh, situations in fab labs currently, mainly focusing on stuff that's going on in the kind of global network and less on the individual initiatives in single labs. In that context, I will briefly address uh, this, this aspect of, of interdisciplinary exchange and learning then I will talk about higher education and, and I'll give you my perspective on higher education and why uh, fab labs are important for higher education and what else is important for higher education. And then I'll briefly uh, report back from talks I had with three fab labs, a very small sample, um, the, the one in Switzerland, in Lucerne, one in the Netherlands, in, in Rotterdam, and one in Spain, in Sevilla. All three labs located at uh, higher education institutions. And uh, I was specifically asking them about this aspect of interdisciplinary learning and if that would be happening. So, Fab Labs and Learning. We all have we all have seen these headlines. Uh, the kitchen table industrialist, atoms are the new bits, factory at home, all these uh, nice developments that started with that book here, that guy over there, and those machines, and uh, uh, all these products. And um, maybe that's the moment when I'm going to tell you how I came into that whole fab lab business. Because essentially by training, I'm an industrial engineer. I'm supposed to set up and run factories. When I come and do fab labs, I do exactly the opposite. I make factories superfluous. So how, how did I end up there? Well, um, as, as part of my biography, I've been uh, moving from country to country, started in Switzerland, lived four years in, in Scotland, in Aberdeen, and uh, then some six and a half years ago, I moved to the Netherlands, where, after learning the language, um, I found a job at Vaag Society in Amsterdam. Kein uh, Heer, an ex-colleague of mine, uh, spoke to you yesterday and told you about uh, the FabLab experience there. Uh, in 2008, I became the project manager of that fab lab there. It had been up and running for a year, subsidized through a project. That project was over. Um, a new project came along with a new project, a new project manager, which was me. And uh, the main task there was to start moving the fab lab from just a project to something more institutional, something more sustainable, something with a, with a longer perspective than just being one of the nice experiments that Vax Society always does. And the Fab Lab struck me as coming from, from that industrial engineering background as something, in a way, quite similar to what I did in an early life, factory automation digital manufacturing, nothing new there. And in a way, the complete opposite, making the big factories mass manufacturing superfluous. And I think that, that uh, tension 
between knowing that technology and what it was doing and seeing that technology doing something completely different, that kind of hooked me in. And uh, then, in me getting to know the Fab Lab, I stumbled upon the Fab Charger. Obviously a set of, I would say, values that the international community put together in 2006 or seven. The values are, the first point is called mission. I wouldn't call it mission. But the first value is to enable access to that digital manufacturing technology, which I knew from my, from my former life as, a, as an industrial engineer. And giving that technology to everybody for free. Second value, actually to enable people to make stuff themselves. And you know, there comes the, the whole story in from, from mass manufacturing, mass consumerism, which already economists in the 1950s told us, hey guys, that's not sustainable. There are many people who still don't believe that mass consumer, consumerism isn't sustainable. And trying all sorts of new tricks to sell us mass consumerism under new disguises. Um, but that's value number two, um, make your own stuff. And then comes the education bit, and I'll then skip the rest, uh, maybe, or maybe not. Um, the education bit tells us that training in the Fab Lab is based on doing projects and learning from peers. And of course that we're expected to contribute to documentation and instruction. And let me pause just a minute by that little sentence there. Training is based on doing projects and learning from peers. I would argue that not only training is based on doing projects and learning from peers, but the stuff we do as researchers, and I quite often come into a file lab as a kind of researcher, asking people, how do you do that? How do you do that? What are your problems? What, what are your expectancies? Well, Etc. Um, this type of research has to follow similar lines. So I get quite annoyed when sociologists come in and data mine a fab lab and then write a scientific paper in it without ever touching a laser cutter. Um, and I guess that's, that's why I need to talk about responsibility, which is number four on this list. The FAB Charter tells us that we are responsible for safety, for cleaning up, for operations, for maintenance, for telling other people, look, this machine is broken, can we please fix it? Can we, together, please fix it? Not, can we call in tech support, um, the laser cutter is broken. Um, and this, I believe, is an extremely important value statement that we as users of the Fab Lab are responsible ourselves for that lab. There is no nanny we can call in. And we have also to police ourselves. You know, when we say, make almost anything that doesn't hurt anyone. And I see people printing out little pistols. Well, okay, it's a toy pistol, but I think it's pushing the boundaries of not hurting anyone. But we're, at the end of the day, responsible ourselves to discuss that. There is no Fab Lab police that will come in and tell you, oh, you shouldn't do that, oh, you shouldn't do that. And this is an attitude that society does not impose on us anymore. We live in a society where there are millions of institutions out there taking responsibility away from us. I'll skip the last two because that would be a completely different presentation and would like to, to turn back to the education bit. And when we talk about education in 
the Fab Lab context. And maybe you have noticed that yesterday evening when Kaimpe was talking, he was talking about something called Fab Academy. Remember? Right, now what is Fab Academy? Fab Academy looks like that on your screen. What you see here is, that's Neil Gershenfeld, up here sitting probably at home in his studio, looking at his computer and giving a lecture to 20 Fab Labs all across the world simultaneously. Here are the lecture notes and here you see a few of the labs participating. This lecture is basically a course Neil was giving beforehand at MIT called How to Make Almost Anything. And this was sort of the, the, the initiating spark for that whole Fab Lab thing. And that's uh, the, the topics that are covered in that course. Now let's briefly go over that, what we find in there. Well, foundations of digital fabrication, technical background, lab, lab safety, okay. Engineering design, computer control cutting, machining, which is all sort of the, 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 the engineering domains, mechanical engineering mainly. But then it moves into material selection, 3D molding, casting, which is more situated in material science. Then it goes on to 3D scanning, electronics, embedded programming, interface application. So there, electronics and IT come in. Sensors, more electronics, networking communications. Then rapid prototyping of rapid pro prototyping machines, which is another um, huge uh, subject, and we, we've all seen the, the, the self-built machines in the exhibition. And then it moves on into collaboration project management, intellectual property, applications, and project development. In itself, and these are some 16 or 20 uh, afternoons, where Neil goes through, say, electronic design and fabrication, something I did at university over a whole semester or two. So in that compressed course, Neil basically rushes the students through a whole section of various engineering disciplines. And that reflects the built-in interdisciplinarity of the Fab Labs. It's not only laser cutting, and it's not only electronics, and it's not only 3D models, and it's not only textile. It's all of that and combined together. So Fab Labs, in a, in a technical way, have some built-in um, interdisciplinarity. What I don't see is economics, humanities, arts, but I believe we could add that. That's the graduation uh, of those uh, Fab Academy students, and I believe Neil's vision behind that is to install a new supranational, international type of institute of technology, kind of a non-state-owned MIT type of thing, which is an interesting thought. But let me um, move back to a few points on the methods Neil tries to use in uh, the Fab Academy. One framework he uses there is the teaching for understanding framework. And I could go a great length in discussing all these uh, points here, but I think that the, the, the first one is 
is the most interesting and the most relevant and also the most challenging for education. The use of generative topics, i.e. we're not teaching maths anymore. We're using topics where we need maths and, 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 and. So instead of having that disciplinary silo approach with generative topics, we get cross-cutting cross -cutting, um, lectures, cross-cutting, it's, it's not only lectures, um, we got cross-cutting learning experience. The community of inquiry framework is important because of that diagram, which tries to symbolize how Fab Academy works. In the center, those Fs, which stands for faculty, are those people who come in and lecture to, to the participants, the S students here. They sit each in their fab lab and they form themselves a community but are also connected to those other people that happen to be in the lab. And they together form this community of inquiry. Now, what has that to do with higher education, except that Neil wants to install that International Institute of Technology and Science? I've looked at an OECD report from 2005, where they're going, individuals need to be able to use a wide range of tools for interacting effect effectively with the environment, physical ones, information technology, social cultural ones, the use of language. They need to understand such tools well enough to adapt them for their own purposes, to use those tools interactively. So that's what OECD is telling us, telling policymakers, telling universities what they should teach students to be able to use those quite varied tools, physical, information technology, social, cultural, language, in combination. And this has been all over the place since the 90s, really. Um, Apparently, David Guest, in, a, in, an, in an article in The Independent in 1991, first used the term T-shaped people. Everybody aware of what a T-shaped person is? No. Right. But it has been there since 1991. Um, well, the, the story in that article was um, some uh, IT business think tank in the UK um, wrote some kind of policy recommendation saying we need in IT hybrid managers who not only understand IT but also understand the application context of, of IT etc. They were calling that hybrid, uh, hybrid managers and David Guest was then going on um, these hybrid managers are a variation on the Renaissance man who are equally comfortable with information systems modern management techniques, and the 12-tone scale. Um, the T-shaped skill set means that the stem of the T symbolizes deep knowledge and experience in one or maybe two specific disciplines, which is our traditional experts. But our traditional experts do only have the stem. The T thing of the T-shaped skill set means that somebody who has this skill set has also 
certain knowledge in various other disciplines and is familiar with various other tools and systems. And uh, that could be technology and a bit of arts and a bit of humanities and a bit of language uh, and a bit of religion maybe. And the idea is that people who do have this T-shaped skill set would then be better able to connect with people, with experts from other disciplines. Now the question is, is, is obviously how do, you, how do you create those T-shaped people? And maybe fab labs are a place to create certain parts of that T-shape. Um, Going to butterfly in you a wee bit because we've we've sort of come into the area of of policy making here, and I've been at a conference in Brussels a couple of weeks ago with the title "Mission Growth: Europe at the Elite of the New Industrial Revolution," and uh, that's probably because um, Barroso and his policymakers have read that book, The Third Industrial Revolution by uh, Jeremy Rifkin. Well, Jeremy Rifkin is actually a, a policy advisor to the EU. So it's, 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 there's a certain logic. And his point um, he makes in the book is that um, the great economic changes in world history have occurred when new energy regimes converge with new communication regimes. And when, when that convergence happens, society is restructured. He gives um, three examples in uh, the kind of executive summary of, of the book he, he sent to, to the European Union. He talks about the hydraulic societies in uh, Mesopotamia, Egypt, China, India, when they became able to manage cultivation and storage of grains and started to write to manage that storage and were able to use that storage as a sort of energy reservoir. That changed those societies. Um, in early modern times, we had coal-powered steam technology and the printing press which together started the first industrial revolution. In the late 19th century, we had electricity and, and the first forms of electrical communication, which sparked the second industrial revolution. And if we follow Jerry Rifkin's reasoning, we're at a moment where we do have two changes in energy regimes, and in communication. In communication, it's obvious, it's the internet. And in energy, it's obvious, it's renewables. And then Jeremy Rifkin argues, those two changes are quite fundamental compared to what we're used to. Because, as we all know, the internet is a distributed network. Every machine in the network is basically a server. And we know from renewable energy that it's best put to use if it's decentralized. So Jeremy Rifkin argues that this third industrial revolution, which has just begun and will last 25 or 40 years, something like that, he told us, will have centralized systems we're so used to, we're so looking for, to new systems which are networked with lateral power, which we don't know how they work. At the conference, we try to translate that into policy recommendations for education. And I think the third one here 
is the important one. Any policies going forward must embrace the reality that Europe needs to coordinate skills initiatives for the new industrial revolution with both growth and well-targeted investment. Okay, of course, that's again saying, hey, EU, please give us money. Um, but it, but it's, it's, it's also acknowledging this line of thought that Jeremy Rifkin set out. And of course, I believe the promise of Fab Lab is that it's, it's going to teach us this idea of lateral power, this idea of working and living in networks, of connecting through the internet, etc. It's a promise, but the question is, what's the reality? And now let me get, get back to, um, to that sample of those three labs I spoke to. Remind, uh, rem remind you quickly of the situation. It's all three labs situated in higher education institution, institutions, which are all very well grounded in the traditional hierarchical way of thinking and working. With all their silos of here's architecture, here's civil engineering, here's electrical engineering, here's materials, here's IT, and maybe there somewhere is humanities and arts and music and what have you. So, and all three institutions do have fab labs and kind of embrace those labs and probably some of them really believe that those fab labs could, could bring them or help them understand uh, uh, that, that new horizon that might be opening up. But the question really is, does this happen? And uh, the short answer is, not really. The long answer is a bit more complicated. Um, one pattern is the work that happens in the labs, particularly when it's connected to education, is still within those traditional silos. There might be other labs around that do it differently, but in those three labs I've spoken to, it's within the traditional silos of of specific disciplines. In some, there are maybe two silos that use the same infrastructure. And that is when it can become interesting. That is when suddenly IT students and art students meet in the same place doing very similar things with a completely different approach and start to ask each other, why do you do it like that? And why do you do it like that? So there we see a, a possibility of that T-shaped thing emerging. But at the moment, as far as I have seen in, in, in those three labs, this is not institutionalized. It's happening by chance. But then, Obviously, the next question is, do we have to institutionalize it? Or should we just let it flow and let it happen? Um, the other thing is that in each of, of, of these three labs, they brought in a new kind of mentality into that traditionally siloed hierarchical institution. In some places, it was more intentional. They wanted to do that. In other places, it happens a bit like, like an accident. And um, sometimes people are a little surprised 
about the courage they had to uh, say yes to that experiment of Fab Lab. There are a lot of questions unanswered, and with only having spoken to three labs, I wouldn't dare to say that is what a Fab Lab can do to a university. I believe we would have to talk to many more, or maybe not, as I stated at the beginning, but just start the experiment. Just go there, do it, try it, and see what happens. So, conclusions, I wouldn't draw any final conclusions, but I would strongly encourage higher education institutions to embark on the journey of that experiment and start to talk to each other and do that experiment collectively. Questions? Is that a personal question? I would be a coward as an anarchist to, to say no. Uh, for me, the, the, the anarchistic element um, is strong. And uh, you know, we wouldn't call it a revolution if it wouldn't be one. And revolutions have always to do with institutions of the, part of the past that are not suited anymore for the future and have to either change or disappear. So, in that sense, the anarchistic um, element is, is quite strong. And, um, you know, in, a, in, in, another, in another sense, maybe, too, because when we talk about anarchistic, um, we see that as a, as a, a counterimage to the established hierarchical structures. And when we think about networks and lateral power from a traditional view, this is complete anarchy. But the real question you're asking is, are higher education institutions really able to change? Time will tell. At a modest level, yes. Certainly. But, you know, from experience, you open such a fab lab in a, in a university. And you've got all your engineering labs, and you know, the, the designers got their labs, and the architects got their labs. They're looking, oh look, particularly the engineers. Yeah, they're coming with that, oh, 30 watt laser cutter, ha 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 ha. That's not gonna work, that's not gonna work. And after a year, this has completely disappeared. Because they see what's happening in there. And they see, A, the energy that people create in the lab, and they see the connection that the lab is able to build with the outside world, which your traditional engineering lab is absolutely incapable of doing. So yes, there, there is transformation happening. Even if it's just, you know, the eye opener, whew, it can be done differently. You know, when I would have to define a fab lab, I would refer back to the FAB Charter as kind of, that's the core values we all believe in. And 
every fab lab takes their own interpretation of the charter. And running a fab lab means implementing the fab charter in reality. So that has always to do with, with interpretation, with, with local settings, um, with, with institutional cultures, with the ideas and energies that people bring in, etc. So, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't see it I wouldn't say it shifts the definition of a fab lab. It's, it's just coming from, from a different angle and, and uh, you know, obviously giving a, a different interpretation to, to the, what we have in mind when we say fab lab. We need to connect the non-university labs and the university labs in a lateral manner. And we should not try to impose any hierarchical structures. And an important point there, many people, fab lab practitioners, when they run into a problem like, say, documentation, they say, hey, can we have a central system doing that? Oh, can we have a central authority giving us health and safety instructions? Which is kind of the gut reaction from the old system. So, we have to be aware ourselves when we fall again into that trap and stop us before doing it. And only in that way, in, in, in doing the lateral thing, we can, we, we can make it happen. And we cannot impose it centrally. You know, that's a weird bit about it. I can talk, go, go around and give talks, but it cannot force you or you or you to... Um, become lateral, if you're not inclined so. In, in general, looking at kind of the Fab Lab world and the hackerspace world, there is this weird trying to, but we as hackerspaces do X, Y, Z, and you as Fab Labs don't, so you don't qualify, and vice versa, on this kind of weird uh, definition discussion, which is the right approach, and, you know, um, that's not helpful. And on a, on a local basis, I mean, Bremen Hackspace is here, so what's the problem? Do we have a problem? No. Okay. Get on hacking. Thank you.